So Dying Light 2 of course is here and hopefully you guys are enjoying it. I have and I've put about 20 hours into the game now. So here are just some kind of random tips and I guess quite a few of them are centered around the loop but I will be throwing some pretty obvious and beginning ones in too. I've got much more focus guides incoming and I've done about 9 or 10 videos already so go and check them all out. Make sure you're here for the home of survival open world RPG news guides and let's go. The fast travel system kicks in after about maybe 8 or 10 hours of story and that's when you'll be able to go from section to section. Now some of the subways will be open as soon as you do restore the power but a lot of the other ones you're going to have to go and actually find and then restore power yourself. So you can find multiple stations sometimes in some of these areas but yeah you're going to have to look them out either using your binoculars or coming across them and then going through either the parkour sort of challenge or maybe filled with zombies or bandits. It's kind of annoying that you've got to take all of these steps just to unlock the fast travel, but there it is. One good thing though, you can travel anywhere on the map using the fast travel system. So if you've just done a mission and suddenly night has fallen, but you want to get back to a settlement or a place, you can go ahead and just click on the map and fast travel to the nearest fastway subway. I mean, you go through the city during the night really super quickly. Also, you do get some goodies once you've booted up one of these. I found a nice inhibitor waiting for me when I did the first one. As soon as you get the paraglider after about 8 or 10 hours of the story, make sure you go ahead and upgrade it. It really makes it more useful. Till then, it's kind of just a way to land safely without taking any damage. But as soon as you get the upgrade, it allows you to keep a little bit of a higher steady lift. Then that will give you more opportunity to get across bigger gaps. The upgrade afterwards is a boost and that will give you even more room to get across and be more manoeuvrable. But they do cost quite a bit of an expensive resource and that's military tech. You'll come across military tech in the early stages of the game if you're looting some of the airdrops. They're normally hard to get as they're on top of buildings and as well as sometimes getting some pretty unique gear or weapons. Sometimes you're lucky you might get some artifact stuff later on in the game or at the very early stages you're more likely to get unique or maybe rare. You normally also get a fairly decent consumable and more importantly the actual military tech itself. You generally only use the military tech to upgrade your paraglider, a grapple and your torch. Now you don't get the grapple until later in the game so don't hog your military tech too long. If you can upgrade your paraglider absolutely do it as it really does help in the loop. Remember that the Craftmaster is where you can buy blueprints so that you can craft a whole bunch of the resources that you find in traders. So instead of going and buying lots of consumables or the immunization boosts, save up your gold and try and aim to get and buy them so you can make them yourself. You probably have built up a big collection of resources if you spent a good few hours in the game and really not wondering what to do with them. So never sell any of your resources because trust me later on you're going to need quite a few of them to go ahead and craft stuff and save them for absolutely getting more gear. The other downside though is that you're going to need a lot of the zombie tokens and some of them do need to be from more rare ones. So I would say hang out more at night and maybe properly aggro some of the screamers but just make sure you're close enough to some sort of base just in case things get a bit out of control or use your bow and arrow to take a lot of the zombies out from distance. If you're far enough they won't actually alert or come chasing you. Also, don't forget to sell all of your jewelries and your items that you find. The game doesn't explicitly tell you that you're not going to need them again. And in some of the quests, I swear I had to give over a few items to get a reward that weren't an actual resource. But after looking again, it does look like it's only resources that you give to quest givers sometimes to get some sort of reward. So go ahead and sell all the valuables that you get. None of them are like that unique. You're not going to be putting them on display anywhere. In fact, it's a bit weird that so many of them are like individually named feels like there was maybe a thinking about a system or possibly they just wanted to add a bit more a kind of in depth to it captain the obvious tip but obviously press the y button and you can set it all in one single go another thing the game doesn't really make very clear is the importance of the crystals it says they're valuable and you can get lots of gold from but also says some superstitions mean they might be useful to keep on you i was half expecting to have to use them for something later on but nope go ahead and sell them and get massive profit you know a bunch of people you saw in a couple of the main settlements in the first part of the game? Well don't get too attached to them. As I found, no spoilers here, that when I went back a little while later, they'd all gone. As part of the story, so I'll leave it at that. What you need to take away from this is, if there's anything you want to buy, you want to stock up, make sure you do so before you have to make a choice about who you're going to help. You'll recognise it when you get there, there's a particular mission 
that it will pretty much ask you to go and choose what faction you want to go and help the most or side with and make sure that you've bought or traded or done anything with any of the NPCs. It's not like there aren't any other NPCs in the area. There is, you'll still find faction NPCs in some of the small towns and settlements, but the major two that you go and appear at, at Bazaar and obviously the Peacekeepers headquarters, they become ghost towns later on. It does get explained in the story, but apart from some random dude that I found in the bazaar with this strange weird black entrance, I don't know if it's a bug, that was it. Maybe a certain choice results in one of them maybe having people in it, but in my game both settlements were empty. A lot of weapons are tied to your character level. You'll spawn randomly in the world at different vendors and locations, but until you reach that level you won't actually see them. So things like the knuckle dusters, well they won't actually start appearing until you've done the mission that involves you getting some knuckle dusters back. And the same thing applies to katanas, you won't actually get that until you've done into the dark mission I do believe, as that's the reward, and then they'll start spawning afterwards. So if you've seen a cool weapon that someone else is using and you want to see it but haven't come across it yet, then you probably do need to reach a certain point in the story or your character level's got to be at a certain point. This is why you don't see many artifact weapons in the first stages, the Villador, but when you go and revisit it later on, you will find them. But generally these can alternate. You'll find different kind of weapons and swords while you're looting and getting stuff from GRE places and of course you can go ahead and just buy them from traders. So if you're worried you're not seeing enough good quality legendary stuff like this, don't worry, you will. Once you get to the loop and you complete most of the stuff in Villador, you should then start getting a lot more of this. The semi-automatic crossbow you can't unlock until you've got level 4 in the Peacekeeper faction. To do so you're going to need to unlock a lot of the facilities around the map, repairing the water pumps, putting electricity back and then obviously choosing the right faction, that will eventually lead you to unlocking it. When you side with a faction after restoring power or water at the faculties, it makes a big deal of the fact that you can either have peacekeepers and all their traps, car alarms and stuff to help you combat the zombies, or you go ahead and have much more parkour stuff like more vents and other jumpers and fallen bags that you can land from safe height. What it doesn't tell you is that they still go ahead and lay a bunch of the stuff all around the map. So even in the peacekeeper zones, you will still find lots of extra events that suddenly get added, especially places that you've already visited, like Villador. So you might not get as many as you would have taken or got if you just sided with the survivors. But yeah, it's definitely something worth noting. You do get access to both faction stuff. In fact, what's meant to happen is the factions just give you a different set of side quests depending on which one you join. And yes, of course, you will get more traps if you side with peacekeepers. But basically, you do get a bit of both. There is guns in the game, but sadly not the kind that you may be expecting. You can get the gun hammer, which is a melee weapon that does blunt damage. And there is also some consumables that you can get that basically act like a shotgun. These are the only two proper firearms in the game. The consumable shotgun literally fires two shots at maybe close point range, and that's about it. It will run out and you have to go and make more. You won't have access to both of them until you get to the loop. Hopefully by now you've realised that if you actually want to keep a certain weapon because you like it, then you need to keep upgrading it to stop it from breaking. That's the only way to stop durability from going to zero. Not all weapons have durability though, of course bows don't, but definitely if you like a weapon you should absolutely try and get the reinforcement mod as much as possible. Apply that to your favourite weapons, keep upgrading that and then hopefully you won't have to worry about your weapons breaking for a long long time. Something I didn't realise until about 12 hours into the game, that there are pools of oil on the floor sometimes, so look out for more environmental factors. The game kind of does tell you this as well when you're trying to take out one of the brigands' captains at one of the outposts, that you can use environmental stuff to take him out quicker. But this encounter here, I'd realised that yep, if flammable stuff goes bang. So pay a close attention to the floor and see if there's any oil, and that might be a quick way to take out some enemies. Just going back to bows and stuff, there is a reason why they put it kind of in the middle of the game. It's because it's pretty OP if you got the right gear on. If you make a big effort to get lots of range of stuff that's got a high damage, you can one shot a lot of the zombies in the head, even some of the more tougher ones or like the screamers. If you are finding that you have to use two or three arrows to take out even just the most basic of zombies, then yeah, make sure you've got the right equipment on and check to see if there's any other boosts with your ranger gear. 
I can honestly see why they did it because it does feel pretty overpowered when you're going through the corridors. I mean, you can still get alerting and have problems caused for you, but yeah, a few arrows to the head and most of the hardest zombies can be gone. A lot of the elemental arrows in the game do pretty much the same job, whether it's fire, whether it's lightning or toxic, they pretty much spread to other enemies nearby. Although I do find that the actual shock ones do seem to work a little bit better if they're close by and they'll properly electrocute any other enemies close to them. Some of the other ones are, I guess, just, yeah, a little bit too weak source and it doesn't make it feel right that toxicity would affect maybe a actual zombie that much. And of course, arrows like Laceration are going to do a lot more bleed damage over time. So at the moment, the best arrows for me are the shock ones for taking out humans close to each other. They'll do a lot more damage. Explosive arrows, obviously. And then the rest are kind of interchangeable. I guess it all boils down to what actual resources you've got and how much you're able to actually craft with them. Although be warned, I had literally hundreds of scrap until I got to the loop and then all of a sudden, bam, I was starting to run out once I started crafting and experimenting with a few of the new items. So yeah, you are going to have to forage and grab as much as you can and I was doing that quite a bit. Also, somewhat annoyingly, it doesn't remember what arrow you was using previously. A whole bunch of times I've pulled out my bow and I don't know if it's a glitch or a bug and it's gone straight to the default arrows even though I was using something before so do make sure you're using the right one every time before you go and fire at something. You can get upgrades for a lot of the locks to make it quicker and easier to get into the medium and hard ones and at first I ignored all this because I just thought nah that would save me some upgrade stuff I won't use my zombie tokens for that but yeah, it quickly gets old having to do this. There are so many chests that have these on them. So if you do happen to have a few zombie tokens left and obviously enough gold to buy them, go to a craftmaster and make sure you upgrade to at least medium. You don't have to maybe in the first few hours, for sure you can just about get by. You won't come across too many hard chests. And as long as you've got perseverance and again, lots of scrap to make your own little lock picks, then you should be okay. I have already mentioned this in another video as well where I showcased how you unlock the bows. But yes, the infected ones are kind of weak source. You have to use quite a lot of the zombie tokens to craft them. And they do make a good diversion tactic. But there's a billion other ways to create that. Firing an explosive, using some bait to get zombies to come over. They effectively just make one human go a bit aggro. Not just on you, but anyone nearby. But yeah, I would say the amount of resources to craft them avoid the infected arrows. And that's about it. Just some big tips that I thought I'd pass on to you. Pretty obvious, some of them, and hopefully they've found a use for you. Go and check out the rest of my guides and look out for even more tips videos from me. I'm going to be a bit more together, taking a look at crafting, taking a look at different weapons and everything you need to know about all sorts of locations like the facilities and a lot more. So check out the rest of the videos that are incoming all weekend. I'm going to have about three or four uploaded every single day. So I hope you're going to enjoy the content. Leave a like, make sure to subscribe for the best in survival open world RPG content and I'll see you ratbags later.